Kicking off at number five, Andrus. A lot of you guys were pretty vocal about him making this list, so here he is. And I'm on board with your insistence because this guy is as vile as they come. In demonology, Andras is an incredibly unpleasant demon whose only directive was to hunt and kill mankind, aided by his henchman, Flauros. As the demonic Guaisha goes, the demonic Andrus was a grand marquis of hell that appeared with a winged angel's body and the head of an owl, or sometimes a raven. It rides upon a strong black wolf and wields a sharp flaming sword. His main responsibility is to sow discord amongst humanity, teaching those who he favours to kill their enemies, their masters and their servants. It is thought that he was often summoned by military leaders who would use his abilities to incite wars that would last for decades, resulting in a new definition for people, the planet and the political landscape. Hmm, interesting. Next up at number four, Valak. And no, not the nun. Well, Kind of the nun, but yeah, not the nun. This guy is starting to get some real traction in popular culture, which, well, is kind of worrying. In the Lesser Key of Solomon, Valak is listed as the 62nd demon of hell, but is often attributed as a grand president of the demonic depths or the city of jewels in several Sumerian texts, who thusly relies on his guile and manipulation of others. He's known as the Marquis of Snake, often attributed with the power to locate, summon, and control any serpent at will. Valak is often attributed to having the power power of finding treasures, or in other terms, the power of divination and demonic insight, which he often uses as a means to discern his victims' true desires and tempt them with it. In the Dictionnaire Infernal, written by Colin de Placy and first published in 1880, Valak is depicted as a small cherub-like child with wings riding atop a two-headed dragon, which is an accurate representation of how he uses the appearance of guile and deceit to manipulate his enemies. Next up at number three, Agrat Bat Malat, possibly the daughter or granddaughter of Lilith, who we've covered here before, Agrat Bat Malat is a prolific demon in Jewish mythology. In Zoharastic Kabbalah, she is a queen of demons and one of the four sacred angels of sacred prostitution, who mated with the archangel Samael, we'll get to him later, and later became the fourth succubi. Her fellow demons and sisters are Lilith, Namer, and Ashteth. In rabbinic literature, she is known as the dancing roof demon, haunting the air with her chariot and her train of 18 messengers of spiritual destruction which is pretty heavy reading, I guess. Agrat Bat Malat also occurs in ancient texts as the mistress of the sorceresses who communicated magical secrets to Amimar, a prominent sage of Babylon. She is also widely tied up in legends of King David, where she bore him the son Asmodeus, king of the demons. Coming in at number two, Zeminiar. Sometimes you have to save the best for a special occasion, which is why there is pretty much next to nothing known about the demon of the name Zeminiar, and that's for a good reason. Zeminiar is one of the four principal kings of hell as aligned in the Ars Goetia, the evidential playbook for the who's who in the demonic realm. As demonology scriptures explain, Zeminiar, alongside his three other kings, Amaimon, Corson, and Garp, were all supposedly constrained by King Solomon and outlined in his lesser key. It's thoroughly noted that Zeminiar should not be conjured under any circumstances, with the sole exception of an end of days occasion. Zeminiar is the king of the north, and with him he brings death and destruction, and alongside his kingly brothers, they are often considered to be an allegory of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is never a good sign. And finally, at a number one spot of scary demons, you should never summon a badan. And boy, is this a big bad baddie. In the Hebrew Bible, the word Abaddon is a biblical term which literally translates to place of destruction, and literally speaking, is a fiery plane in the realm of the dead, known as Gehenna. However, in the later teaching of Revelation, Abaddon is often referred to as a being that had become one with the abyss, and personified it as the angel of the abyss. In Greek, the equivalent for Abaddon is Apalion, which literally translates to the destroyer, which is exactly what he is. In demonology, it is often cited that even a demon as powerful as Satan openly emits that he wishes to avoid a confrontation with Abaddon. Yeah, he's pretty super serious. He's often depicted as a large human-sized locust, or in fewer cases, an entire swarm of locusts that carry highly infectious diseases. Abaddon is said to be the plague of locusts called upon during the Ten Plagues of Egypt and responsible for causing many atrocities in biblical times. In all seriousness, Abaddon is a complete enigma. At times, he's often depicted as an angel of judgment, and both heaven and hell claim him as an ally, other times as an enemy. In most texts, that speak of him, Abaddon is amongst the most feared of supernatural beings, having both angels, demons, and corporeal beings fearing his very name alone. So, yeah. 
the devil shall appear. Kicking off at number five, Chimaris. And boy, is this name synonymous with the demonic art of war. Also known as Chimaris or Chimis, as the 66 demon laid out in the Ars Goetia, one of many 17th century texts that continues to be our source for all things demonology. It's interesting because, according to Wade Baskin's Dictionary of Satanism, a controversial philosophy handbook written in 1972, Chimaris is a theoretical allusion to the Chimarians, a warlike people mentioned throughout the classical period as living and dwelling in complete darkness. Chimaris is depicted as a godly warrior riding atop a black horse and possesses the ability of locating lost and hidden treasures. His primary demonic function is to mould men into warriors of his own likeness, bolstering his ranks into doing his bidding. In Hell, Chimaris holds the rank of Marquis and is served by 20 legions. In Alistair Crowley's 777, Chimaris is attributed to the differing Hebrew spelling and is alluded to represent the Four of Discs, a manifestation of black light which is also a form of the Egyptian god Horus and the alleged dawning of a new dark age. Next up at number 4, Lamashtu. This is a pretty nasty one and you'll soon see why. In ancient Mesopotamian mythology, Lamashtu is a terrifying female demon that preyed on children and women in childbirth. In Akkadian she is Lamastu, in Sumerian she is Dime. In few cases she was worshipped as a malevolent goddess of demigoddess and feared by the common people. She kidnapped children while they were breastfeeding and would gnaw on their bones and suck their blood. Despite that though, she was the daughter of the sky god Anu, the supreme deity of ancient Mesopotamian religion. Lamashtu was often depicted as a mythological hybrid with a hairy body, the head of a lioness, donkey's teeth and ears, long sharp fingernails and the razor talons of a bird. She is also commonly compared to the demon Lilith, Adam's first wife in Hebrew texts and Jewish folklore, who refused to become subservient to him in the Garden of Eden. Yas Queen! Coming in now at number 3, Astaroth. We're cranking up the heat now. Astaroth, also known as Astaroth, is the great Duke of Hell in the first Goetic hierarchy, alongside both Beelzebub and Lucifer, and makes up the third part of the evil trinity. This guy is ancient when it comes to the pedigree of demonology ranking, whose name is ultimately derived from the Phoenician goddess Astarte, a deity dating back to the second millennium BCE. Astaroth first cropped up in the book of Abram Melin, a Hebrew text written in 1458 and the cornerstone of most occult grimoires throughout the following centuries. In it, he is an arch demon, a great and powerful duke that commands untold legions of demons. He comes forth in the shape of a foul angel, sitting upon an infernal dragon and carrying on his right hand a viper. Astaroth seduces humanity by means of laziness and self-doubt and also gave mortal beings power over serpents. Swinging in at number two, Mephistopheles. That's a mouthful. Also known as the much more convenient Mephisto, this guy is perhaps the most renowned demon in Germanic folklore. Originally appearing in the historical Faustian legend, in the legend the scholar, the historical Johann George Faust, wages his soul in a pact with the devil. In essence, Mephisto is the demon that does the dirty work for Lucifer, who doesn't walk the earth with the intention to tempt or corrupt mankind, instead seeks out those that have already damn themselves to darkness. Mephistopheles often appears as a friar dressed in grey and commonly roams the woods and forest places waiting to stumble upon curious individuals. He does not advocate wrath of straight up violence, instead relying on the intellectual game of tricking the human mind into submission, seeing mankind as more of a plaything than any direct threat. And finally at our number one spot, Pemon, a demon that is both incredibly famous and incredibly mysterious, that is hard to tell which side of the coin you'll get. Pemon is named in the Lesser Key of Solomon, the Daemonium, the Dictionnaire Infernal, the Liber Officium Spiritum, the Book of Abram Melin, and the Grimoire of Pope Honorius, also in the new film Hereditary. But despite that, his origins still remain shrouded. Amon is the ninth spirit in the Goetic roster, ranked as a king throughout Hell, and in historical text referenced to as the King of the West. He is referred to as primarily in necromancy, being listed as the commander of 200 legions of spirits and possessing the power to raise the dead from sand. He's also commonly found to corrupt priests and bishops, using them as pawns in his long sprawling game of demonic chess. Pemon is described as a man riding a camel, often tailed by jesters and musicians playing haunting trumpets. Sometimes he is faceless, other times he has the face of a woman or a small child. He speaks in a hoarse, weak voice, conversing only in his native language of hell, unless commanded to speak the summoner's own language. My advice, just avoid conversation altogether. Kicking off at number five, 
Abraxas, who is perhaps one of the most mysterious entities in the whole of the demonic glaciers. Throughout ancient history, Abraxas is referred to many times as an archon, an eon, a demon, and even a god. In the ancient theology of Gnosticism, Abraxas is continually referred to in the holy book of the great invisible spirit as an aeon, a species of cosmic intrigue that inadvertently created the Demiurge, a mysterious malevolent force of unknown intent. Abraxas really has been around for as long as anyone can recall and his mystic uncertainty is what guides his rank in the demonic hierarchy. In Jacques Colin de Plance's Infernal Dictionary, Abraxas is labelled as the supreme god of the Basilidians, a Gnostic sect that were wiped out sometime in the 4th century and whose motivation in history is unclear. There are a series of mysterious relics left behind though, a vast number of engraved stones dubbed the Abraxas stones, of which purpose no one really knows. Spooky. Coming in at number four, Mammon. Mammon, who takes up a role as one of the seven princes of hell, who in more interpretable terms makes up the seven deadly sins, is the demonic manifestation of greed. Mammon is widely considered to be a demon of Syrian origin. As Peter Lombard, the Bishop of Paris stated, riches are called by the name of a devil, namely Mammon, for Mammon is the name of a devil by which riches are called according to the Syrian tongue. Bit of a mouthful. Throughout many ancient texts, the word Mammon crops up to describe an entity of greed and avarice. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, Mammon is referenced as a fallen angel who values earthly treasures over all other things. Later in contemporary occultism, Colin de Plancy describes Mammon in the Dictionnaire Infernal as Hell's ambassador to England, which I'm not entirely sure if I'm insulted or not. Either way, Mammon has cemented himself a pretty cushy demonic existence by hoarding material wealth and corrupting others to do the same. Next up at number three, Nabarius. And this horrifying little dude first appeared in the grimoire from the Deceptions of Demons, written in 1583 by Johann Weyer, the famed Dutch occultist and demonologist. Supposedly, Nabarius is the most valiant Marquis of Hell and has 19 legions of demons within his sphere of influence. His intention is to make men cunning in all art, but his most prolific intention is to make them cunning in rhetoric, the ability to influence with one's voice. Nabarius speaks with a hoarse voice and also procures lost honours and dignities, as in he collects people of weak morals. Nabarius appears in the form of a three-headed dog or a raven and presents himself with a loud and raucous voice, but speaks eloquently and amiable. Concerning the name of Nabarius, it is often thought throughout demonic literature that he is associated to the Greek Cerberus. The three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. In his grimoire, Johann Weyer considers them to be one and the same. So, I guess this guy was making the rounds. Swinging in at number two, Samael, who is a very interesting and oftentimes perplexing figure in theology and demonology. Samael in Hebrew is described as the venom, the poison, and the blindness. He is an incredibly important figure in the Talmud, where he is seen as the accuser, the seducer, and the destroyer, and is often regarded as both good and evil. Oh, and on top of that, he's the archangel of death pretty big boots to fill. It's in the Kabbalah where his roots in demonology begin though, where he is tied to the demon Lilith, the first of the succubi. With her, Samael created a host of demonic children, including a son, the Sword of Samael, who you may know as Asmodei. In Gnosticism, Samael appears as the blind god and comprises one third of the Demiurge. Often through Gnostic texts, he appears as a lion-faced serpent and is perhaps one of the oldest malign references throughout ancient scripture. And finally, our number Number one spot, Leonard. And to be honest, I've been wanting to cover this guy for quite some time simply because of his name, Leonard. The antiquitous pronunciation, of course, would be Leonard, but come on. It's Leonard. Also known as Master Leonard, as laid out in the Dictionnaire Infernal, he's the Grand Master of Nocturnal Orgies and Demons. In folklore, he is represented as a three-horned goat with a darkened human face. He marks his initiates with one of his horns and is often considered the demonic representation of the goat. In demonology, infernal powers obtained from the worship of Master Leonard range from metamorphosis into monstrous animals or even causing men to fly as an incubus. It is often thought that Leonard is associated with the iconography of Baphomet, or the Goat of Mendes, a figure worshipped allegedly by the Knights Templar. In scripture, he was worshipped at black banquets held in Leonard's honour, where dead baby goats were eaten without salt and boiled with reptiles to deliberately spoil the meat. I mean, that's just a waste, really. Kicking off at number five, Namtar. And this guy is pretty savage, although 
it kind of comes with the territory when you're the literal Mesopotamian god of death. Namtar, also known as Namtaru or Namtara, is loosely translated into destiny or fate in the ancient Mesopotamian language and was considered to be a chthonic minor deity in the mythologies of the ancient world. Just a little side note, chthonic is an absolutely awesome word and it literally means subterranean in ancient Greek. Chthonic, Cthulhu, I see what you did there. Namtar was considered to be the god of death and minister and messenger of An, Eric Shigal and Nergal, the three major figures of ancient Mesopotamia and Sumerian mythology. He was considered to be responsible for diseases and pests and it was said that he commanded over 60 diseases that emerged in the form of demons that could penetrate different parts of the human body. In other Sumerian texts, Namtar was widely considered to be the personification of death, much like the modern concept of the Grim Reaper and he held dominion over the fate of mankind. Pretty heavy responsibility. Coming in at number four, Rangda. In Balinese folklore, there are some insanely terrifying creatures known as the Layax, a creature in the form of a flying decapitated head with bloody entrails still attached that seek out pregnant women in order to suck their baby's blood. Well, let me introduce you to their queen. Rangda, and she is absolutely horrifying. In Balinese mythology, Rangda is the child eating leader of an army of evil witches in constant battle against her eternal opponent, Barong, leader of the army of light and the forces of good. Good guy. Rangda is often depicted as a mostly nude old woman with long, unkempt hair, pendulous breasts, and claws. Traditionally, her face is a horrifying fanged and goggle eyed mask with a long, protruding tongue. It is often thought that Rangda played her part in the incarnation of Kalon Arang, a legendary witch in Javanese folklore that wreaked havoc throughout the late 10th century. Kalon Arang sacrificed her own daughter to Rangda at the Temple of Death and unleashed a great flood of death and disease. Gnarly stuff. Next up at number three, the botchling, which technically is a blanket term, but it kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Whether you call it the Poronius or the Drekovac, this malicious demon from Slavic mythology is something that you should just totally avoid altogether. In Slavic folklore, these demons were believed to come into existence from stillborn fetuses, but also from improperly buried remains of children that had died during infancy. If you've played The Witcher 3, then you'll know what we're getting at. Not dissimilar to the Myling of Scandinavian folklore, these creatures are considered to be extremely powerful demons due to the innate potential energy caught up in an unrealized life and their particularly tragic entry into our world. Still there's hope because as Slavic mythology tells us, if a botchling is buried beneath the threshold of a house, then instead it will turn into a klobuk, a protective house spirit, and then everyone's a winner. Swinging in at number two, Moloch. And now we're getting into some pretty gruesome ground in ancient history. Moloch, oftentimes referred to as Molech, Milcom, and Malcolm, is the biblical name of a Canaanite god associated with child sacrifice. He often appears in the image of a large, ferocious humanoid bull dressed in flowing robes and golden tipped horns. Ancient rabbinical traditions depict Moloch as a bronze statue which is heated with fire into which the victims of his sacrifice were thrown. This is tied to ancient Greco Roman texts that associate this act of child sacrifice to Carthage and their worship of Baal Haman. Moloch has traditionally been interpreted as the name of a god, possibly meaning the king, but is also pejoratively mispronounced with the Hebrew vocalization Bosheth, meaning shame. Moloch is the shameful king, a creature of metal and fire that consumed countless children in ancient civilization. And that makes him pretty terrifying. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, Asmodeus. And this guy is one of the biggest players in the entire host of demonic entities throughout literature. Asmodeus, also known as Ashmedai or Ashmadeva, is a grand king of demons or in Judeo-Islamic lore, the king of the earthly spirits. He is mostly known for the deuterocanonical book of Tobit where he is the primary antagonist and the great prime evil. Asmodeus is often referred to as one of the seven princes of Hal where each one of these princes represents the seven deadly sins, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, the pride and the sin of Asmodeus lust. This guy is perhaps one of the most prolific demonic entities in literature and appears countless times throughout mythological and religious texts. He is tied to the testament of Solomon and the creation law of the Temple of Solomon where he began a campaign of malintent against the legendary king. In the Malleus Maleficarum he is described as having 72 legions of demons under his command and serves only his emperor Lucifer. He incites gambling and is the overseer of all the gambling houses in the court of hell. Now that's a table I'd never want to sit at. And on that note, 
I guess the house always wins. Coming in at 5, Boogeyman. The Boogeyman is a mythical creature used by adults to frighten children into good behaviour. This demonic creature has no specific appearance and conceptions vary drastically by household and culture, but it is commonly depicted as a masculine or androgynous monster that punishes children for misbehaviour. The Boogeyman or a somewhat related creature can be found in every culture, and is used for scaring children into good behaviour depending on what purpose needs serving. Often based on a warning from the child's authority figure. The term boogeyman is sometimes used as a non-specific personification or metonym for terror, and in some cases, the devil. While the description of the boogeyman differs on cultural levels, there are often some shared similarities to the creatures. Many of these demonic creatures are depicted as having claws, talons, and sharp teeth. Along with that, the majority of boogeymen are of the spirit variety, while the minority are demons, witches, and other legendary creatures. Some are even described to have certain animal features such as horns, hooves, and bug-like appearances. When examining the personality traits of the boogeyman, they are most easily divided into three categories. The kind that punish misbehaved children, the kind that are more prone to violence, and the kind that protect the innocent. However, they all relate in the same way, being that they all exist to teach young children a lesson. The more vicious boogeymen are said to steal children at night and even eat them. Sucks to be those kids. Coming in at number 4, Annabelle. Annabelle is a fictional character in the Conjuring universe. The character is a haunted doll based on accounts by paranormal investigators and authors Ed and Lorraine Warren, with the doll first appearing in the 2013 film The Conjuring. Annabelle is a reportedly haunted Raggedy Ann doll. According to Ed and Lorraine Warren, self-described paranormal investigators and demonologists, a student nurse was gifted the doll back in 1968. According to reports, the doll behaved strangely, exhibiting malicious and frightening behaviour. It was at this point that the Warrens were called in, and they removed the doll to their museum after pronouncing it demonically possessed. The doll was kept in a glass box at the Warrens Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut. The story served as an inspiration for the opening scene of The Conjuring, where the doll is depicted as a sinister, worn out porcelain doll, as well as its spin offs Annabelle, Annabelle Creation, and Annabelle Comes Home. In The Conjuring Universe, the doll is a powerful demonic entity that, despite being able to exist independently, frequently latches onto a porcelain doll to torment those who own it. Annabelle is considered the most dangerous and powerful, and has a weird habit of wandering around unseen. Coming in at number 3, the Malabranch. The Malabranch are the demons in the Inferno of Dante's Divine Comedy, who guard Belizea V of the Eighth Circle. Vulgar and quarrelsome, their duty is to force the corrupt politicians to stay under the surface of a boiling lake of pitch. When Dante and Virgil meet them, the leader of the Malabranch, Malacoda, assigns a troop to escort the poets safely to the next bridge. Many of the bridges were destroyed in the earthquakes that happened at the death of Christ, which Malakoda describes enabling the time this takes place to be calculated. The troop hook and torment one of the barriters, identified by early commentators as Ciampolo, who has named some Italian grafters and then tricks the Malambranch in order to escape back into the pitch. The demons are dishonest and malicious. The promise of safe conduct the poets have received turns out to have limited value, and there is no next bridge, so that Dante and Virgil are forced to escape from them. Coming in at number 2, Mundus. Mundus, also known as the Prince of Darkness, is a devil prince from Devil May Cry who ruled the demon world 2,000 years ago, overthrowing the previous rule of the demon world and threatening the human world. Sometime after conquering the devil's throne, Mundus' rule was challenged by the demon god Argosax, and a great war followed that divided the underworld into two sides. Upon trying to take over the human world, the demon swordsman Sparta rebelled and defeated him and his enemies, sealing him away in a vault on Mallet Island. To quote Tomio Otsubu, visually he looks like a god. He purposely makes himself look godlike, so we took that to heart by making his silhouette godly and majestic. The crumbling second form is meant to show how pitiful he really is in contrast with the majesty of that first form. Form. Mundus' appearance when he battles Dante is that of a gigantic living statue of an aging, muscular, bearded man with enormous feathered wings, resembling figures such as Zeus or even God. During his final battle with Dante, portions of the statue began to break away, revealing a grotesque, writhing mass of living tissue, with three eyeballs and hundreds of hands coming out of it. In the game, he is depicted as the epitome of evil. He has no compassion for his minions and acts without regard to their loyalty, killing 
killing one of his own generals, Griffin, after the latter failed to defeat Dante. His powers include supernatural strength, supernatural durability, demonic energy, manipulation and flight. He also is capable of demon creation, mind manipulation, power augmentation as well as orb summoning. And finally, coming in at number 1, Payment. King Payment is a spirit named in the Lesser Key of Solomon and appears as the ninth spirit in the Gosha, the 22nd spirit in the Pseudo Monarchia Daemonum, and the Dictionary Infernal. The Gosha, Weya, and Duplancy warn that if King Payment appears alone, a sacrifice must be made to summon Babel and Abalam, two kings who serve under him but do not always accompany him. These three sources also state that he rules 200 legions of spirits, some of which are of the order of angels and the rest powers. In the Gosha, Weya, Duplancy, and Sloan MS 3824, he is described as a man riding a dromedary camel, preceded by men playing loud music, usually trumpets. Sloan MS 3824 describes the camel as crowned, while the rest describe King Payman himself as crowned. The Gosha and Weya both describe him as teaching science and answering all questions, specifying that his knowledge includes all arts and secret things such as knowledge regarding the earth, its waters, and the winds. The Gosha and the Weya also claim that he has the ability to bestow dignities and lordships as well as credit him with granting familiars. In Abramelin, King Payman's powers include knowledge of past and future events, clearing up doubts, making spirits appear, creating visions, acquiring and dismissing servant spirits, reanimating the dead for several years, flight, remaining underwater indefinitely, and general abilities to make all kinds of things and all sorts of people and armor appear at the behest of his magician. Well, there we have it. Do you guys agree with our list? Were there any demons that we missed? Leave us all your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below, and perhaps we can do a part three. Before I go though, I just want to respond to a few comments from one of our last videos. Top five scariest cosmic horror comics you need to read. Jared Pixley said, I love you Queen Lucy, will you marry me? I'll cook for you every night. I mean, I've got a problem with marriage. We don't talk about it, but sure, I'll marry you. I like food. Phantom Flower said, I help run a comic shop and I'll tell you my dark lady Lucy, there are so much more horror comics that would send shivers up the most hardened reader's spine. I hope you cover them. I'll potentially cover them if you ask nicely. Please ask nicely. Pete Williamson said, finally realized how you look shocked and surprised with your eyebrows. You just pull your ponytail back harder. Love you Lucy, keep it up. I love when my ponytail is pulled back harder. <laughs> I like it tight. That boy 353 said, I'm only here to see the extremely corny comments about Lucy. There are plenty to sort through. I think my responses are cornier than the comments, so you're welcome. And on that note, if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss another scary bit. Until next time, see you later.